welcome back everybody for our next speaker. Uh, short raise of hands, who knows about the company Canva? Yes, lots of them. Olivier is actually one of the founding developers, so from our one was there when Canva was started, one of the most successful um, company when it comes to design still uh, as of this day. He then went in a different direction, focusing on sustainability, on AI, on how this impacts our current world, and then he founded Carbonifier. With more than 20 years of experience, please give me a hand for Olivier. Thank you very much. So I'm Olivier, first time in Austria and even first time in uh, Vienna. Uh, so I used to work until very recently at Elastic, you might know about it, and uh, I'm founder of a project for measuring the carbon footprint of cloud in general with Carbonifer. Another, another project coming named Rebase, where we're going to use AI to clean uh, software and infrastructure. So let's talk about the, the big problem. So if we want to respect uh, the Paris Agreement of uh, limiting the global warming of 1.5 degree by 2030, we need to reduce our carbon footprint by 45% by that time, which is like very challenging. And as IT, as software engineer and uh, ops engineers, uh, we have a very uh, big responsibility because IT is now emitting more CO2 than civil aviation. So everybody is very worried about like taking a flight. Uh, there is even a word for being shame of taking a flight. So yeah, I, IT is now emitting more CO2. And looking at some projection, we think that by 2030, IT is going to use 20% of worldwide electricity. That's huge, and only in six years. And data centers, as you can see in green, uh, like are taking a big share of it. So when you think about uh, IT, we think about software, hardware. The sole purpose of hardware is to run software on it. That's pretty obvious. And this hardware is using energy to be manufactured first and then to run. And this energy usually emits some CO2. But not only CO2. Like you have a couple of other gases that uh, has a, a greenhouse effect, like methane. And so that's why usually we speak about carbon, not only carbon emission, but uh, CO2 equivalent emissions. And not only CO2, so today I'm going to focus only on CO2, but you think about the water usage to cool down data centers, uh, mining problems, biodiversity, IT waste, and some other things like noise. So I'm very happy to have a photo of Hedgehog on my presentation. So let's talk about the elephant in the room, uh, the Cthulhu in the room, like I love to say, I love to uh, name it, uh, the generative AI. Uh, and I use generative AI for that, for that photo. <laughs> so you might have heard of those numbers, big numbers of parameters of LLMs, like billions and billions. And we're thinking of ChatGPT uh, uh, having maybe, or GPT-4, sorry, having maybe uh, more than a trillion of parameter. And this insane race come as a cost. Uh, we see on uh, the black graph that the more parameters it has, the more computational uh, 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 for training it needs. So that's pretty obvious. So we have this race between the number of billion parameters we want to have and the hardware we need to align in front of it. And now we have heard that AI is going nuclear. Like the data centers uh, make a, a good effort in the recent uh, years to try to uh, come up with cleaner data center using greener electricity. But as you can see on, on this extract from the Google sustainability report, uh, the trend is reversing and uh, the guilty is uh, the AI. So yeah, now data centers are even buying, uh, Am Amazon for example is buying uh, uh, nuclear plants. And, building their data center very next to the nuclear plant. So it's direct distribution, I guess. So let's take an example. We think that by 2027, if NVIDIA, uh, uh, if all NVIDIA GPU sold are running at the same time, it will require more than 100 terawatt hour for a year to power that. It's basically more than uh, the electricity consumption of Austria and around like the same uh, consumption of uh, the Netherlands. So it's pretty big and it's not only Nvidia, it's just GPUs I'm talking of. 
So from the watt hour, how we calculate the CO2 emissions. Uh, so we have a couple of sources. One I really love to use is electricity map because you see in real time on live per hour, the carbon emissions of different countries and different grids. So I tried this morning, I, I updated this uh, slide this morning. For example, in Austria, we are a little bit less than 100 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. So if you have used one kilowatt hour, it's easy to calculate how much CO2 it's, uh, it is. Uh, France is all nuclear, so the carbon footprint is obviously uh, s um, smaller. And the storm is coming, so I'm pretty sure the, the wind farm are producing a lot today. And on the other side of the ocean, as you can see, it's a little bit a mess of US, but if you look at Calif and California at the same time, it's way more uh, carbonated, let's say. Something's not working. <laughs> so yeah, that's pretty bad to have that. Yeah, it's better than that. Yeah, okay. So this is actually one ton of CO2. Just put some uh, photos and some uh, visual things about that in front of that. So one ton of CO2 is this big bubble. And uh, US uh, inhabitant is emitting every year uh, 14 times that big ball. And in Europe, we are more like basically dividing by two. And basically one ton of CO2, it's pretty easy to uh, have an analogy, is one trip, one transatlantic flight per uh, passenger. So it's a little bit more, a little bit less, depending on uh, how you calculate it, but let's state one ton is one flight, so it's gonna be easier to represent. And our target as human being is to go below two tons of CO2 and two flights per year. So it's really challenging. So let's look at the case, uh, chat GPT. So we think that GPT-3, and we don't have numbers for GPT-4, and even for GPT-3, it's just big estimation. We think it's around five, uh, 500 tons of CO2 for training only chat GPT. So it's already like 500 flights to New York. And for inferring, we think like per year, it's like that massive. And as you can see, uh, training and inferring are like can be very different and most of the time people are focusing on training like the number of computational it needs to train uh, a model but think about inferring as well it's uh, it's a, it, could, it could be a big a big issue as well so yeah as we just saw like we have two phases basically main two phases training and inference so most of the time training is done once uh, and uh, for training, you need energy, which is coming from um, what we call embodied energy and use energy. Embodied energy is basically the energy required for manufacturing the device, manufacturing the hardware and dispose it. And uh, use energy is the actual electricity entering your data center and your server. So training energy uh, uh, is done and then after you have inference energy. So keep that in mind, you have these two phases. So for training, for example, as we can see on the graph on the right, the more parameter you have, the more it's emitting CO2. That's pretty, that's that simple as that. So I did this calculation for you. It's around two to eight megawatt hour uh, per billion of parameter. So depending on the size of your uh, model you're using, you have a very good idea of how much electricity it required. And it's around one ton of CO2 per billion parameter basically a flight uh, to New York and even two, if, depending on how you calculate. So as you can see on, on the bottom, it also depends on the grid. So for example, Bloom has been trained in France, for example, and GPT in US, and you see like it's reflecting directly on the energy consumption. GPT-3 is way bigger. Uh, it's not way bigger, it's actually the same size of Bloom, sorry. But uh, because of that, uh, and because of the, uh, because of the, um, the electricity coming from the grid, uh, the CO2 emissions varies a lot. So when you talk about fine tuning, so basically fine tuning is completing the training by looking at some specific uh, data set. Uh, so normally fine tuning is like a fraction of the cost of training. So keep that in mind, it's just a fraction of it. So if you are not 100% pleased with an LLM model and you want to train it on some of your data, it's better to use an existing model and fine tune it on your data. So a good example of fine tuning is coding LLM. So I put a couple of examples here like Codex, CodeLama, uh, GitHub Copilot, etc., etc. So for example, GitHub Copilot is based on Codex, which is based on uh, GPT-3. And because they are using a smaller version of GPT-3 and uh, just fine tune it, 
the footprint for training is way smaller. So basically think about smaller model plus a smaller data set for fine tuning, it leads to smaller uh, CO2 emissions. I mean, you can have guessed that, but we checked. At inference time, well, you have two ways to look at it. The first way is hosting. So if you are hosting an LLM and for inference, for use by your uh, users, uh, you will need to have some uh, servers uh, to, to run that. And, or if you are using like a service like uh, OpenAI, GPT, API, or this, this kind of service, or on uh, Hugging Face, would like to have this number per request, basically. So I did a little bit of calculation. Uh, if you are looking at Bloom, uh, which has 176 billion parameters, and if, I want, if you want to host it, there is this handy formula where you can calculate how much GPUs you need for that. So I spare you the calculation, but basically the P is what is important because it's the number of billions of parameters, and the Q is like the precision you want to have. Usually you have like something between eight bits to 16 bits of precision, and there is debates like what's the best, but uh, I assume let's use 16 bits. Uh, in that case, we think that Bloom is using the uh, 400 gigabytes uh, for uh, GPU RAM. So it's run six NVIDIA A100. So NVIDIA A100 is like the most popular uh, one. And calculation in terms of what per GPU and then this setup. This setup, if you run this setup for a year, it's going to be 15,000 kilowatt hour, which is roughly three to five European household of electricity consumption. It's not that crazy, but it is what it is. At inference time, uh, so if you leave it running for an hour, so I am uh, doing like, for example, three requests per second. I calculated that each request is less than one watt hour and 100 requests is around like charging uh, a smartphone basically. And uh, Bloom uh, and uh, Sasha Luccioni, I think, uh, she uh, and the team, uh, uh, managed to do this calculation on the sun and they released in very interesting papers and they come to the number of four watt per request which is way more uh, smartphone charging so what's the big difference between that is i think i assuming we are hammering the server compared to them so it's like 10000 requests per hour compared to them where it's uh, 500 requests per hour so obviously if you are running so that's the, this is the minimum setup. So between six to 16 NVIDIA GPUs. Uh, if you have this setup and you are sending a request once per year, for example, this request obviously has a carbon footprint massive. If you're hammering it as using at right size, like I'm not teaching you what is right sizing in infrastructure, obviously the carbon emission for each request is gonna go down. So in terms of CO2, as we saw earlier, if you look at electricity pair maps, you have a good idea of what the carbon emission per kilowatt hour. Uh, so if you, we take this example of Bloom, 15,000 kilowatt hour uh, for uh, AWS with a PUE of 1.2. So the PUE is the number of electricity, the number of kilowatt hour you need to inject in the data center to get at the end one kilowatt hour useful for the, for the hardware. Uh, so depending on the country, it can vary from one flight to New York <laughs> to, 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 to build it, uh, to host it, sorry, to five flights uh, to New York to, to host it. So yeah, please be careful of where you host your, uh, your uh, infrastructure in general. So I'm going to quote a famous management theorist, uh, which is born actually in Vienna, uh, Peter Drucker. If you can't measure it, you can't improve it. That's pretty, pretty obvious, but he stated. <laughs> so going back to this beautiful formula, it's pretty obvious energy multiplied by PUE and multiplied by the carbon intensity, and it's the number of CO2 that is supposed to be emitted. Uh, be careful, energy. Think about the energy for manufacturing the hardware and the energy for using the hardware. So if you have a shared hardware, for example, running different containers on the same server or using my virtual machine on GCP or depend on what you want to do, it's going to be pro rata of the embodied energy for the full server that has been manufactured, for example, in China. So you need to be careful about that. So obviously, fortunately, we have some tools to help you to do that. Uh, one tool I love to use is MLCO2 Impact. So it's that simple. You select the type of hardware. 
the number of hours you want to use, where you want to host it, and it gives you the number of kilograms of CO2 it's going to emit, so that's pretty handy. And if you are using, like pretty much a lot of people, Python to instrumentate your, uh, or orchestrate your uh, LLM and the query and training of your LLM, you can use those tools where uh, you can have the carbon emission per epoch, for example. So if you want to use to, to do this calculation per request, I really lo love using this uh, very handy tool. Uh, uh, it's been built by Genai Impact, which is an NGO uh, trying to measure the carbon footprint of AI, as they are do doing. Uh, so basically, you check, uh, you, you, you select your, uh, basically your LLM, so Meta uh, Lama 2 in my example. Uh, an example of task, so depending on the task, it can vary a lot, and it gives you the energy and the CO2 emission for one request. So again, like if you want to size uh, a service and you have an idea of how many requests you're going to have, you can use this tool to make this calculation. But at the end, it's still a uh, virtual machine and hardware that is run uh, under that. So if you, all the, the three major uh, cloud provider have their uh, sustainability tool where they can give you like basically the bill in terms of CO2 for running your infrastructure. So you can use it, but be careful that usually talking about market-based energy. So if they are offsetting everything, or they are buying green electricity, they take that into account. And sometimes you have good surprises. For example, if you look at my uh, energy, uh, sustainability bill uh, on of my uh, servers in Paris, it's always zero because everything has been offset. So yeah, trust it or not. So let's look at some open source and maybe more neutral uh, methodologies. One I really love to use is Cloud Carbon Footprint. So unfortunately, you need to host it yourself. But basically, it reads the bills of AWS, GCP, Azure, you name it. And it can give you, like, looking at the detailed bills, like you have run one server for one hour, et cetera, et cetera. And it makes the calculation for you. And my little project, uh, which is estimating your Terraform project, so if you have, like, uh, your GKA, um, uh, described uh, as a Terraform file, it will read it and come up with some estimation, really rough estimation, but it gives you like a sense of, is it like bad or good what you are doing? Once you have measured, you can start to reduce it. So rule of thumb, if you're spending less, usually you're saving carbon emission, worth for the electricity bill and it's worth for uh, the, 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 the server you're running uh, through, through the cloud, for example. It's not always the case. Think about all the edge cases you can have. For example, if you are using reserve instance of AWS, if you're reserving instance for three years, it's going to cut your electricity, uh, your cut your bill by 50%, but it's not cutting your CO2 emission by 50%. Same thing if you want to migrate to a country where uh, your uh, like price of uh, EC2 instance uh, is a little bit cheaper. It's not. Uh, decreasing the carbon emission. For example, if you want to move from France, where I live, to Ireland, where it's a little bit cheaper, it's going to be like uh, something like uh, multiplied by seven, the carbon emission. So think about it. It's not always a good thing. But if you're in the same environment, if you spend less, obviously, you save same CO2 emissions. So there is a lot of FinOps tool. I just selected one just for, for, for this talk, uh, CubeCost, and give you the, the, the measurement of the expense on a cloud provider for your uh, Kubernetes environment. And obviously, if you spend less, you're going to emit less. And it gives you like uh, uh, tips for reducing it. Coming back to uh, LLMs, uh, so smaller model, smaller data set from fine tuning, depending on hardware, depending on grid. Those are the training decisions you need to take. Uh, smaller is better. During inference, smaller model, have uh, a smaller impact in per request. So yeah, think about it. And uh, you can translate even that in number of tokens. You have like really, really good resources and paper to come about that. Type of task, generating an image, uh, is way more emitting than uh, generating some text. And uh, think about like some new things like a mixture of experts where you can uh, reduce the or improve the efficiency uh, in terms of performances and the precision, of course. You have some architect architecture decisions to do. Uh, for example, 
multiple agent system. So this is not really like something you can find easily in the wild, but basically it's having like a hybrid system where you have like different LLMs experts to do a specific task and s each model are smaller. So basically if you mix them uh, on the long run, it can be like uh, interesting and mix it with some non-AI, for example, rule-based uh, stuff. Uh, you can do some hardware decision. Uh, NVIDIA GPUs are not the only one on the market, so you can compare different things. I'm going to take one example, which is Grok chip. They are very good for very low latency. They are really good for text generation and only for inference. So basically, you can use your good old GPU for training, and then after, if it's just text generation, use Grok chip for uh, inference. So think about that. And then if you are operating uh, an infrastructure, uh, think about auto-scaling, right-sizing, basically. So any ways of auto-scaling, uh, you can do it. Uh, there is even a CADA operator named Carbon Aware CADA operator when it's going to be plugged on basically stuff like electricity maps and adjust your, carbon uh, adjust your infrastructure depending on the carbon intensity of the grid. Uh, Kubeflow as well for AI, it's a good, good, good tool. And observability, Kepler for getting like the, the, the power usage of your uh, CPU and GPU. And think about carbon awareness, like again, having some auto-scaling, it's good. Uh, even auto-relocating, like depending on the carbon emission of the grids, uh, you can move your infrastructure in different countries. Everything is containerized, I think. And think about scheduling at the right time. Here is an example where in California, uh, Sometimes they have like so much solar energy and so much wind that it's m more producing more than the demand. So basically, at some point, electricity is what we call curtailed. It's like basically produced for nothing. So use it if you want to take a decision when to use, when to run, when you when to train a model. Do it at the at this time. So. We have I've de described AI like a Tulu earlier, but maybe it's more like a Godzilla, where it can be as good or bad, depending on the situation. And here in this film is fighting pollution. So first, the bad Godzilla. So if your AI is helping selling more TVs on your marketplace, uh, 100 TV extra equal 40 tons of CO2 for the lifetime of the TV, 40 transatlantic flight. So think about it. And for example, another example is has been documented that uh, for exploiting the permanent basin, which is one of the biggest uh, reserve of oil in the US, uh, they are using a lot of AI to like, optimize uh, drilling and finding oils. So basically, AI in that case is helping releasing these 40 billion tons of CO2. So yeah, that's a bad example. Good example the other way, on the other hand. For example, Global Fishing Watch, they're using AI to detect uh, illegal fishing and rainforest connection. They are using AI to detect uh, illegal activity in the rainforest by listening to that and trying to understand what's the, what's the illegal activity it's done. And something I did not realize is basically how much it's going to compare with humans. So if you are typing a text on your laptop on desktop compared to if you're letting AI generating the text, you're pretty surprised. It's log log logarithmic scale, by the way. So yeah, for one page, yeah, if human is not really required, yeah, you can use some other uh, AI tool, and it's really interesting to have this kind of perspective as well. So a few takeaways, like think about it. AI is still running on hardware, so basically auto-scaling, all this kind of good ops st stuff are really good. Smaller is greener. Uh, you can question using AI, uh, is it really the solution? Do not train, reuse. Like Same thing in, in, real, uh, in real life, don't buy a new bike, reuse an old one. Uh, you can ask for the model carbon footprint for being trained if you're using, for example, a, a ging face. Uh, I think they'll come, come up with a solution to have this number uh, one day. You can calculate estimate measure, always calculate estimate measure, and try to come up with the carbon return on investment, how much carbon you're going to uh, spend to have what you want to do. Uh, thank you very much. I put in this slide a QR code for getting this uh, presentation if you would need to have access to the source and the papers I was talking before. A good paper I can encourage you to read is the one from uh, Sasha Lucioni. I have based a lot of my uh, talk uh, on uh, this paper and all the, the papers she's done. And yeah, check those websites and podcasts. Thank you very much.
Great. Thanks for the insights. Uh, we're perfectly in time, so we have still a lot of time for questions. Yes, question over here. Again, we have gummy bears. So until recently, uh, the power consumption of data centers was actually less than all the network equipment in between clients and servers. Is this changing now? Is I, th I have not read something saying that, but from the top of my mind, that should change because, uh, like, if you are using ChatGPT to generate some text on the network, it's going to be just transiting just a bit of text. So yeah, same thing. Like you have all the tools for, like, for example, EcoIndex or EcoGrader. When you give a website and it gives you the carbon footprint of the website. Remember, it's just the UI of the website they are checking. So basically, if it's using AI to just generate some text, if they run it on the ChatGPT website, of course, it's going to be very, very low in terms of CO2, but on the back, the, the CO2 emissions, yeah. Any other questions? Four, three, two, yes. I got a question, actually. Um, recently, I noticed that there are different types of runtimes out there for AI, like VLLM and so on and so forth, and they are differently efficient, like mm -hmm. compared on latency and so on and so forth. Did you also compare that one? Uh, yeah, uh, you, can, you can check uh, Sasha Luchoni paper because she is giving a lot of uh, that. I, I haven't checked the... Uh, efficiency of different uh, yeah kind of on that you can have that but yes there is like different of techniques uh, once it once the uh, I, I would say like if you have the same number of parameter in two different LLMs and you compare the efficiencies there is a lot of things that can change a lot of decision that can be made during the training that can affect the efficiency of that. I haven't explored it here because we have very little uh, publication on that specifically. But uh, if you are running an LLM which is more powerful, more efficient, it tends to be more carbon e efficient. If it's just efficiency of like, for example, a, sim a, s a single task taking less GPU, less CPU. If it's just a matter of running time, if it's taking less time to perform a request, it can use more GPU, more CPU, so and you, you need to check that. But unfortunately, there is very little literature on that, and you don't have like a, 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 um, a list of different LLMs and uh, power for usage, power for inference per request and stuff like that. They, nobody is publishing that. That's why I come back to this, it's just like, give you a sense of, <laughs> uh, and, and that as well, uh, give you a sense of, uh, uh, like an idea of how much, uh, what per request at the end. Any final question, somebody? Yeah, here. Yeah, perfect. So, um, here, yeah. <laughs> Get you. So when you speak of Bloom, for example, you yep. point out that Bloom uses less carbon, uses, mm, the carbon footprint is, is lower because it runs in France, yes? Yes and they mainly use nuclear energy. Yes. Even then, we're using not renewable, renewable energies. Is there any studies being made on running those models, those AIs on renewable energies? So if you are sure of where you are running, like if you have solar panels and you're running it just uh, on your machine, which is powered by solar panel, think there is maybe half of the carbon footprint coming from the embodied energy, the manufacture of this uh, of the device. So if you're buying a graphic card specifically for that task, the energy footprint for manufacturing that is still, is still there, even if you're running it uh, on a renewable energy, or even if you're not powering it, you just leave it in the box. It's still emitting. It has been already emitting a lot. So think about that. So basically, when you see like this, uh, I don't, I don't really this uh, this slide. Here, I suspect this is only the carbon footprint of the grid during runtime. They are not taking into account uh, the carbon footprint for uh, manufacturing the, the device. Okay, thank you. If there are no further questions, there are two more administrative points. Uh, short raise of hands, who already participated in the AWS quest? 
Okay, that's pretty sad. <laughs> um, if you didn't do so, check out AWS booth. They have like a quiz quest thingy where you can win some awesome prizes. If you already participated, make sure to go back there and pick up the prize because it's only valid today. So you can join tomorrow. Um, that's the first point. Uh, second point, an object was found. So if somebody, especially from the back seats, is missing something, please pick it up with me here. And the third point is we now have a 20 minute coffee break. So make sure to be back in 20 minutes at Hall 6. Thanks. Thank you.